Big thanks to Seam for inviting me here a couple of months ago. Delighted to be here. And also, uh, Timo has said he, I will be kicked off the stage at 25 minutes exactly, so I won't spend much time at introductions. So basically, an engineering guide to chronic disease avoidance. I've been researching in this field for six years and recently published a book with an American doctor going through all the metabolic pathways and what you need to do to avoid not just cardiovascular disease, but most modern chronic diseases. And part one is, if you don't measure it, it don't get fixed. And I liked Tommy raised this issue just a few minutes ago. And in engineering, it's hugely important. You've got to measure the correct measurements that reflect the root causes that drive the issue. If you're measuring the wrong stuff, like cholesterol, you may get very distracted. And I'm going to bring up Pareto. So Pareto was a superb uh, individual sometime in the past, and he had the principle that 20% of your effort in an endeavor will deliver 80% of the results. So you've always got to focus in the best places where there's the biggest bang for the buck. You can spend 80% of your time on stuff that gives you back 20%. And this is a universal principle. And for me, 20% of the root causes in any particular problem, and I'm an expert problem solver, whether it be heart disease or stress cracking and high volume uh, manufactured products, 20% of the root causes when it's multifactorial will account for 80% of the improvement you can get. So it's really important for root cause. I'm going to introduce you to David Bobbitt, one of Ireland's biggest entrepreneurs. He owns and runs a $700 million business. And I'm going to tell you a little of his story. So he was 52 years old a few years ago, and he was slim, fit. He was jogging four times a week, six children, ultra-focused on health, and pretty much a hacker, if you will, trying to really stay alive as long as possible. And he was described by the docs as bulletproof. You've all heard that word, right? His doctors did very advanced testing on him, treadmills, ECGs, stress tests, all the bloods, and he was all good, no worries. Basically 5% framing him risk, top 10% for his age fitness. But then he got a calcium scan. He got a scan that actually sees inside your heart and in five minutes tells you your degree of arterial disease. That's a Pareto type test because it's a huge bang for the book for five minutes and a couple of hundred dollars. And it showed a score of 906, which meant he was actually in the worst 1% of heart disease for his age, right? With a 50 to 70% chance of a heart attack or death in the following 10 years, not 5%, like the blood said. So he realized, I'm in serious trouble. And the calcification scan, uh, is su it goes ahead of all other tests. Hands up, who here knows that the calcification scan of the heart is one of the most powerful measures of heart disease in the world? Honestly, yeah, that's a problem we're working to fix. Only a couple of hands. So his angio showed severe blockages in three primary coronary arteries. He did not go for surgery because he researched and he found out that surgery and stents will not extend his life. They will only change symptoms. He went with lifestyle nutritional fixes that he learned about and some medications. And he took six months off his business to study this. He found out a couple of months later he was grossly diabetic, undiagnosed by our current blood tests. And that's, of course, what was driving the massive amount of atherosclerosis in his vessels. But he also discovered heart disease is resolvable, and you can stop the calcification process and get back to safe levels. Nutrition was the primary intervention for him. He set up the IHDA charity made a movie, The Widowmaker, we'll send you all a link, which explains this whole test and the history. And it's all philanthropy, no profit motive. So atherosclerosis and calcification, the biggest killer in the world is heart disease, overwhelmingly due to atherosclerosis, the inflammatory disease of your arterial wall. So we see here a young guy on the left, and he's fit and healthy, and a cut through his artery shows that there are no uh, atheroma or problems on the inner wall. And we see a middle-aged average office worker, and there he's developing these little pustules or boils. They're like infections on the inside of your artery wall, and they go on to give the heart attacks. But this guy's ones are early. When you go on with the arrow of time, these things begin to expand more, and immune 
components come in. You get white blood cells, red blood cells. It begins to become a hot infection, if you will. And then calcium is recruited by our body to come in and shore up this dangerous problem. So bone matrix is formed to stabilize this plaque. With more time, you get a calcified plaque, and at this stage, it shows up on the calcium scan I mentioned to you, and you can see that you've got big disease at this point. But if you don't get a scan and you don't do anything, these plaques will get worse, they will get vulnerable, you will get mini ruptures, you may not even notice them happening, you will get thrombos, and that may cause strokes or heart attacks. Things are getting worse with time over the decades. And ultimately, myocardial infarction. And you go down and it's game over. Around half of the people who get a sudden heart attack through this process don't get up again. They don't get to go back. But what if you could go back in time, in the time machine, and realize and get a scan and find out that you were heading for the wall? Could you do something? Well, you could. You could implement the fixes that David and many, many more people are implementing, and you could stabilize this plaque and basically have your arteries stabilized, calcified, but no longer growing, because it's the growth of the process that causes the events. And you can get to see the grandchildren after all. So the calcification scan, on the left we see the scan, and that's my co-author Dr. Gerber there with a zero at 40 or 54 years of age. I have a zero at 48. And you can see there's no calcification in those coronary vessels. So that's called a warranty for a human, a middle-aged human. Your risk is so low with a zero. On the right, we see a guy with a lot of chalk in there. You can see the red oval. That's a score of five or 600. That guy has massive risk compared to us, right? And it's clear as day on the scan. It only takes a minute. So I'll show you a few figures. I don't want to drown you in studies, but this huge one a couple of years ago, you can see zero scoring people or low scoring had a 1.4 and 4.1 chance of a heart attack in the following 10 or 12 years. And that's pretty good for middle-aged people. What do you think will happen if your scores get higher? You're going to get a bit higher in risk, yeah, for a heart attack. You sure are. 37% for the very high-scoring people. That's 20 times more likely to have a heart attack. If your cholesterol's bad, you might be five times more likely. Your blood pressure's high, maybe 1.8. Calcification, 20. It's an incredible test. And that's a Pareto-style test because you get massive bang for a tiny buck. Another bit of data, this time death. Calcification predicts all-cause mortality all the heart stuff, and some more besides. This study shows that low scorers, 0.6% died of this large group of patients after 12 years, I think it was. You can see with the increase in calcification measure, they had much worse outcomes. But what do you think the high scorers had? And they're walking around all amongst us. 23% were dead after 12 years in a fair, like-with-like -like comparison. So 40 times more people checked out by having an extremely high score. I'm not sure I meant to take questions now or after. Maybe hold it. Again, super Pareto. So I have a guy, Noel, just for one more story, 42, an engineer, three children, very focused on health. His doctors, in spite of him having a bad family history of heart disease, his doctor said, your cholesterol's low, your bloods are good, you're fine as an individual. He forced them to do treadmill, they said you're fine. He insisted on a calcification scan, wouldn't give it to him, but he got through and got it against their wishes. And he got a scan, result of 25. So at the age of 42, he really has the arteries of a 64-year-old. He had diffuse calcification throughout his coronary tree. So remember, the calcification test supersedes all of the other proxies and markers. He has a choice now, and he's taken it, to fix his problem and stop his calcium progress progressing. And he will get to live long and strong, because it's a disease that you can impact massively with what you eat and how you live your life. So part two, I'll move on to fixing it. And I can't go into huge detail because of my time, but I'll go through some. Pareto principle again. I'm going to show you some people who really have hacked 
without even knowing it. On the left, we see the calcification for the US population. Going across, we've got age groups increasing. Going back into the page, you've got the worst percentile people for calcification. As you can see, the 5 or 10 percent worst calcifiers, they get a massive rise with age. That's where most of the heart attacks occur, okay? But what about the Semaine people, right? They're doing some really good things, and I've pulled out some of the key ones. They have really low blood insulin, low blood glucose, no diabetic physiology versus the majority in the West, no hypertension, their blood pressure doesn't rise with age, no central obesity, obviously, and they have great omega-3 to omega-6 ratios. What do you think some of these factors in their lifestyle will translate into in terms of calcification? Let's have a look. Oh, and one more point. They have no metabolic syndrome, no hyperinsulinemic syndrome. That's what all these numbers really mean. The primary driver of heart disease in the world. So that's what they've got. In 700 random people of all ages from the Semain, they've got basically no calcification. They have the lowest heart attack rate in the known world. That's a Pareto moment. But maybe these guys are special unicorns. Right? They got weird genetics. Maybe it's not as I say it. Well, no, because the Katavan people have the exact same biometrics, the exact same kind of environmental inputs, right, that are healthy and ancestral, and they get, again, incredibly low rates of heart disease. And there are many more examples. So this shows you the goal you're playing for, right? You're playing for that. LDL, has everyone heard that LDL is a really important driver of cardiovascular disease, the bad cholesterol? How many people have heard that? Yeah, now we're seeing a big response. Uh, but as mentioned earlier by Tommy, that thing's getting into the past, but a lot of doctors don't know that. Here we see calcification from low up to very high in the Nixdorf study. You can see the LDL for the different groups of no disease up to massive disease. But notice with LDL, the guy in the black there on the left has no disease, zero score. He's got an LDL of 128. The guy in the right in the red shirt has massive disease, as bad as it gets, super high. He's got an LDL of 128. So LDL can't be used in an engineering world. It's an ambiguous and misleading marker. But again, a lot of people don't know that yet. Blood pressure and diabetes type 2 in the same study are linear and dose response up with calcification. And that makes absolute sense because they are manifestations of hyperinsulinemia and essentially insulin resistance, right? And again, Pareto would be all over these phenomena and he wouldn't be looking at cholesterol at all. We've got a problem in the last few decades and it's an enormous problem. All the media, all the articles are all focusing on cholesterol, as I mentioned, salt, fat, you know, healthy whole grains for your heart, exercise. That's good, though. And does meat cause cancer? And, and a myriad other, other things, right? That's where all the talk is, chattering in the airwaves. But what's missing? What's missing is the goddamn elephant, right? Hyperinsulinemic syndrome is the elephant disease metabolic process in our modern world and it's not getting airplay. 65% of US adults above 45 are now essentially diabetic. So think about it, two thirds of the older adults are essentially diabetic, and that's CDC figures. I didn't make those up. And that makes me angry, because this is completely preventable. So some primary causes, and again, I have limited time, so a lot of the root of the root of the root of the cause goes down to your adipose tissue and whether it's healthy. The adipose tissue crosstalks to your liver, pancreas, and all your body's systems in an incredibly complex hormonal milieu. So your fat tissue is crucial. I show here yellow subcutaneous fat, and I show brown visceral fat that you get between your organs behind the muscle wall. The red dots are infl inflammatory activity. So when your fat becomes dysfunctional and inflamed, that's where disease comes from. Again, safe fat, subcutaneous, ass, legs, you know, non-inflamed, perfect energy store. Not a big deal if you have a lot of that, if it's healthy. Sick fat, visceral, inflamed, internally, massive issue. And you can get an MRI, but most people don't. 
So four types of people, and I want you to think, which one am I? Top left is the best, metabolically healthy, normal weight. These people are slim, pretty fit, they're normal weight apparently, and they're insulin sensitive. Their fat is in excellent condition, right? It crosstalks perfectly with the rest of their body, and they have very low risk for disease. Their liver is protected even when they do eat the occasional bad thing, right? Their fat acts as a buffer. Next guy, apparently slim, metabolically obese, normal weight. These guys are insulin resistant and they are very high risk. They appear to be not obese, but they have got visceral fat building up between their organs and it's highly inflamed and it's causing their whole system of crosstalk between all the organs to basically collapse as they will. They will collapse in not a long time frame away because they're highly diseased. We're not really measuring for this. Another word from them is tophies, thin outside, fat inside. That's another term you may have heard. Metabolically unhealthy obese. Now these are the guys who are huge and although they've got insulin resistance and huge risk, at least they know. They know they're very overweight and that correlates with, with death. At least they're aware. But the last guy I talked to you about might not be. That's the tragedy. And I won't spend much time on the fourth, it's metabolically healthy obese. Very important for our understanding of the science, but essentially these metabolically healthy obese people have a personal fat threshold where they can expand fat very large without it becoming dysfunctional and without generating visceral fat. So they're genetically lucky, essentially. They're a minority of the really super fat people. I'm gonna bring you back though to this core group and this is where myself, David Bobbitt, and Irish Heart Disease Awareness are most focused. These people, around 50 million US adults would be in this box. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't appear to be obese, but they have got metabolic dysfunction in their fat, they're insulin resistant, and they've got huge risk, and they don't know it. And these are the most tragic group. So that's where we focus on awareness. So why, why do you end up with dysfunctional fat? And I'm gonna to have to do the short version here with the limited time. So I have given talks all over the world on the deeper biochemistry and uh, hormone interactivity that leads to this problem. Uh, this one was Miami with the Physicians for Ancestral Health, but they're all on YouTube. You can send links later if you wanna get into the depth. But for the moment, I'll keep it simple. Root cause diagrams are what engineers use. We see blood clotting and endothelial damage is the core problem with atherosclerosis and heart disease. And that leads to the, most of the deaths. Top left, we've got excess fructose and excess glucose, excess refined carbohydrates, right? This is one of the primary drivers of the problem. Or if you've had a heart attack, the first thing you do is you've got to eliminate this. Or you're going to get your second one. Again, can't get into detail, but there is mountains. I have a thousand papers, published papers I've been through on all these mechanisms. This leads to disruption of gut hormones, which in turn cross talk to adipose tissue, to liver, talk to insulin, raise your insulin, and manage the release of insulin from your pancreas. So these upper gut hormones are hugely affected by the food you eat. And the cascade goes down into hypertrophy, which is expansion of your fat cells beyond the size they should be, and then their insulin signaling breaks down. Then you get into liver and systemic insulin resistance, where your whole body begins to collapse in terms of its signaling capabilities. You get the atherogenic dyslipidemia, you get the low HDL, the high LDL, the ratios go out of whack, your triglycerides go up, all that stuff on the cholesterol panel, overwhelmingly. When it indicates bad things, it's being driven by insulin resistance syndrome, right? It's not really a cholesterol thing at all. And that is one of the primary drivers of our heart disease today. I'll hasten to add that heart disease is multifactorial, no question about that. And I'm just listing a series of things outside of insulin resistance that can directly drive arterial distress and develop atherosclerosis. And I won't read through them there, but the slides will be available later. But there's, there's lots of them. Most interestingly, many of these other problems that directly drive arterial disease, they also drive up your insulin and your insulin resistance through immune response and many other mechanisms. So the insulin is not only a very important causal 
uh, vector in driving heart disease, but it also acts as an amazingly accurate gauge of something else wrong under the hood. So that's why myself and Dr. Gerber and our worldwide network have a huge focus on blood insulin measurements. Pareto would be all over this like a rash, as we say in Ireland, no question. So primary solutions, and again, keeping it simple within the time. One thing you can do if you have arterial disease or are worried about having it in the future is a healthy, low carb, high healthy fat diet. You got a picture there from Diet Doctor, the world's biggest low carb site, and it's all delicious ancestral food, no crazy stuff or drinking back buckets of cream, real food. What you don't do are breads, modern processed foods with refined cellularly structure, broken carbohydrates. They're the biggest offenders. And vegetable oils, of course, are in all these processed foods, and they're a big deal in a bad way. Suboptimum omega-3 and uh, excessive omega-6. Primarily in the modern world, the excessive 6 is coming from vegetable oils. If you cut all those out, you're probably be pretty okay. Don't need to worry too much about nuts and stuff. What you can do is eat fatty fish for DHA, EPA, and cod liver oil brings a whole range of fat-soluble vitamins, right? So that's a great and very cheap way to just keep yourself topped up. You don't go near vegetable oils. There's the lady doing something rather disgusting there on the right-hand side. But uh, you avoid those like the plague, and processed food is always a problem. Suboptimum magnesium, K2. There are other vitamins and minerals that are very important in the control of the system. So there's a subset of five or six you should certainly be looking at, and you can get it in bulk, magnesium citrate, potassium chloride, very inexpensive, and just mix it in with food, dinners, stews. That's how we get our five children, the whole family sufficient, right? So there's quite a few vitamins and minerals. And lack of UV or vitamin D and nitric oxide released from your body by the action of UV on our, your skin. That, that's a challenge also. Now you can get UV lamps, FDA approved. So if you don't have much sun around, you can always top up. If you're really stuck, you can use supplements, but that's not quite the same thing. Couple of big pieces of artillery to hack your heart health. Fasting behaviors, huge, and the literature is exploding on how beneficial these are. Autophagy and myriad other pathways. And strength training is the best exercise in our mind for developing muscle, and for getting an insulin sensitivity, you know, with less effort than you might have to spend running around and around and around. I got a black one. Okay, bottom lines, one and a half minutes. Middle age, middle risk, not sure of your health status, maybe you're like Noel, maybe you're like David and you're heading straight for the wall. You don't know, your doc doesn't know. What do you do? You get a calcification scan, the best test for arterial disease and future heart attack in the world. 30-year-old technology. You get a low score, congratulations. You either have good genetic resistance to modern foods or you've been eating pretty well anyway or doing other good things. Keep an eye on your bloods, follow the rules, should be okay. Five or seven years later, don't need to get it too quickly, you check you've still got a zero or a very low score with low progression, then you're still good to go. But you might find it's gone surprisingly high and you need to root cause why. Okay, but generally down bottom, you're in good nick. High score, very different matter. This is where all the widows are, right? If you get a high score, you've got to do the job. You've got to look at a lot of blood markers, and I've only put a few there, but some of the important ones. Not LDL cholesterol is not going to help you, but the triglyceride over the HDL or total divided by the HDL will. Uh, serum ferritin, iron measurements, GGT, the liver enzyme. There's a whole host, homocysteine whole host of important biometrics that you can investigate if you've got a high score. And you've got to do it for yourself, for your family, for your, for your future. I mean, it, it's up to you. I'm sorry, guys, but it's up to you. A lot of anti-medication sentiment out there. Some of the medications and anti-inflammatories can stabilize plaque if you have high disease. You can decide to go off them after a year or two when you figure you have found the root cause of your problem and you've stabilized your plaque. That's a choice. You certainly want to follow the basic rules and you want to move on down the Pareto of causes because you could have a special cause like heavy metal contamination or some, you could be APOE4 genotype, right? 17% of the population. And you could have a sensitivity to excessive animal protein and fat, you know, a special case. 
So there's a lot down there if you've got a high score that you'll need to explore. But I have no doubt you'll find it. And two years later, if you've got a high score, you want to check in because you don't want to wait too long. You want to make sure whatever you did is working, right? And stop the increase. Now, if you do this, if you do what I said there, and there's a lot more, you'd have to watch my other videos, you'd be following Pareto, you'd be doing the engineering thing if you followed that. But if you want to eat heart-healthy whole grains, and you want to take heart-healthy vegetable oils, and you want to depend on some blood tests to decide whether you live or die, right? If you want to go that route, well, then I think you have someone to follow. This guy here. Thanks, great stuff. Thank you, you are. Um, that was great. So we'd have time for one audience question if Someone. anyone wants to wants to do it. Yeah. So what is the best age to take the scan, Ivor? Perfect and salient question, yes. The guidelines now since 2013 in the US and in uh, Europe are quite clear. 40 to 45 years for a man, 50 to 55 years for a woman. And the reason is that people at younger ages can have high calcification with enormous risk, but there's so few in percentage terms, it's not really practical. So 40 to 45 for a man, 50 to 55 for a woman. There are studies on younger people in their 30s with calcification, and you still do see the 15 or 20 times multiplier of risk with the calcification score, but so few people at the younger age would have it, you're scanning a lot of people to pick up very few. Awesome, thank you, Ivor. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>